So James, you're the winner of the Ultimate Fighter Creator of Game Changers. For those who haven't seen Game Changers, can you share with me what has been your journey to becoming plant-based? Yeah, so I was training for a UFC fight with a future heavyweight champion who had about 70 pounds of muscle on me yeah. and unfortunately tore ligaments in both of my knees. Yeah. And I thought, how can I spend my time productively? Uh, so I started researching uh, the peer-reviewed literature for nutrition for optimal recovery. And that's when I came across a study about the Roman gladiators. So archaeologists unearthed over 5,000 gladiator bones uh, in Ephesus, Turkey. And they did a strontium calcium analysis and a right radioisotope analysis. And you can tell the gladiators were eating almost exclusively plants. And I thought, well, that can't be true because you need meat for muscle and dairy for bones. Of course, yeah. That's what we think, right? Yeah. And so that sort of set me on this sort of search for truth in nutrition. And uh, interviewed the head of nutrition at Harvard, the head of anthropology at Harvard, the president of the American College of Cardiology, and just really started digging into the peer review research and realized I'd been fed a lie, both sort of in some of the you know, articles and magazines and all of the advertising that was reinforcing that we needed those animal products to be fed and healthy, and it turns out you don't. And so that sort of set me on this journey to plant based nutrition. Wow, because everyone, I mean, when we're growing up, everyone believes and everyone's told that we need to have animal products to be healthy. Totally. And you especially need them for healthy bones to grow up fit and healthy and, and happy. So what is the difference between animal protein and plant protein? Because many people have a belief that plant protein is inferior to animal right. protein. Right. Well, there's these protein scoring systems, uh, PDCAS and DS scoring systems that rank the quality of protein. But the problem was, um, or is, that they were built for, uh, by the WHO and the FAO looking at starving children in developing countries. Right. And in that regard, they may have some benefit uh, to using those scoring systems. But to me, we're looking at protein in the wrong way. When you're in the developed world, you have access to plenty of calories and a wide variety of food. We should really look at, when we talk about protein quality, is the package of the food. So does it come with saturated fat, cholesterol, uh, advanced glycation end products that can cause cancer? Right, or does it come with polyphenols, phytonutrients, fiber, and all the things that come with plants? And so the, the protein scoring systems are really a bit antiquated. They're not very accurate. They don't test plant protein in a good way. In fact, um, at Game Changers Institute, which is a research education advocacy platform promoting plant forward eating, has actually published something in the peer reviewed literature on the problems with those protein scoring systems. Um, and so I think we need to look, take a, a different look about how we assess protein quality. And the reality is that when it comes to muscle building and to health, it doesn't matter, um, for muscle building specifically, it doesn't really matter if that protein's coming from uh, animal protein or from plant protein. It still gets the job done, and you still build just as much muscle. But then on the health side, there's benefits to getting your protein from plants. So why do you think there's this um, overwhelming belief, that, especially among men, that having meat equates to masculinity and people who don't eat meat or are vegan or whatever, they're somehow less masculine? Yeah, I think it's multifactorial. So um, originally, you know, men would have been doing all of the hunting, right? And it feels like even maybe back then men were insecure about their masculinity. Yeah. So they feel the need to, felt the need to upplay the role of hunting and how yeah. important it was. Whereas when you look at um, foraging societies, 80% of the calories were actually coming from the gathering, mm -hmm. from the women and the children and the grandparents, whereas 20% of the calories were coming from the men. When you look at the equator, yeah. right? As you move away from the equator, um, it does appear that you need more animal foods because of the environment. But when in the equator where we um, originated, uh, 12 hours of sunshine, 12 hours of dark, plenty of rain, right? And there was abundance of plants. And so you can get all the, all the nutrients and the calories that you need from those plants. Um, but I think that men in the past probably outplayed the role of hunting. And certainly, and certainly, you know, way back, it may have been important occasionally if you're in a survival situation to hunt, or it's not in that situation anymore. So I think it started there. And then, you know, with kings and royalty, you know, sort of celebrating the sort of the meat and the hunt, that probably played a role there. And we have steakhouses, that's where you go after celebrate, a, you know, a business yeah, dinner. Exactly. And so I think there's a lot of masculinity, but even just wealth, you know, as we see yeah. countries becoming more wealthy, they emulate the United States and other developed countries in their meat consumption. And so it's all, all based on a sort of a myth and a narrative, because humans, after all, are narrative-driven animals, right, which mm. really separates us um, mm. from other animals. And so 
it really is based on this narrative and it's a false narrative. Mm. And unfortunately, when you eat this way and you eat lots of meat, as well as lots of processed junk food, yeah. you get these sort of um, diseases of affluence. Uh, yeah. And we need to move away from that and go back to the plants. Yeah. Do you have people ask you now where you get your protein from? Still, yeah, every day people are um, wondering where I get my protein from. I mean, since I've gone uh, plant-based, I've uh, got stronger and my endurance has improved even as I get older I'm, I'm just getting stronger. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, when practically, you know, I basically say, well, where, do you, the, where does the protein that you eat get its protein from, right? It comes from plants. So yeah. animals are just the middleman. Yeah. And so you can remove that middleman. And the, that middleman is doing you a disservice. Yeah. Right? It's absorbing a lot of the, the phytonutrients. It's mm. utilizing the fiber. And it's giving you saturated fat and cholesterol and all these other things. And so you can uh, bypass that middleman and go straight to the source. Yep. Protein does not originate in the animals. The animals get it from plants, and so that's where I get it from. But then people will say that farming the plants, if we were just to be farming plants, mm. that it's more harmful for the environment than farming animals. And I get this comment a lot, and yeah. I don't know where this is well, that, that's largely because uh, I think the concept comes from, well, there's a lot of monocrops, right, like soy and so forth, and we are chopping down a lot of the rainforest for soy production. Mm. But over 95% of that soy production uh, in the rainforest is for animal feed. Fed to animals. Right, yeah. so there's a really inefficient ratio. It's like around 33 calories into a cow to get one calorie out, for example. Yeah. And so if we could free up that land, right? In fact, yeah. and for sustainability also, if we could free up that land, we could rewild that land, which draws down more carbon, mm. and we could feed more people. In some cases, we're literally taking um, food from countries in which people are starving to death, literally, and then feeding them to our animals. Emily Cassidy, who was a senior science writer for yeah. NASA, um, did an analysis and showed that we could feed an additional 4 billion people if we grew food directly for human consumption. Wow. Um, so, yeah, we don't need to be putting it through the middleman. It's inefficient, it's not healthy for us, and it's not great for the planet. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to fire some quick questions at you, some quick myths. Okay. All right, okay. <laughs> so some of these have come to me directly, um, and some of them users have sent in for you to okay. answer, cool. all right? So, I mean, you've kind of already answered this one, but you can't build muscle without meat. Yeah, well, the research is clear, and even since the Game Changers came out, there's been news research, which is great, showing that, um, you know, you can have all this mechanistic speculation around our amino acid profiles and how much leucine, in particular amino acids, are in animal protein versus plant protein, but that doesn't address the downstream physiological effects of muscle building. And so th those systems were never, you know, those scoring systems were never built for those downstream physiological effects. And when you actually look at the outcome data, uh, plants or animals, you grow just as much muscle. As long as you're getting around 1.5, 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, yeah. which is around that number, um, then you're going to build just as much muscle. And so, yeah, it's a total myth. Uh, plant protein is just fine. It gets the job done. So just on that, what do you eat in a day? Oh, I mean, obviously, you know, it's difficult to give a, a standard bed, so I have a bed of the sun. Yeah, I know, so I might eat um, oatmeal, uh, we'll have a lupin in it, which is a really high uh, protein uh, legume. Okay. So I mix half oats, half lupin, uh, peanut butter, uh, cocoa powder in there, cherries, nice. banana, like a cherry chocolate oatmeal, basically. Yeah. I might do a smoothie okay. right, with greens and berries and, and that type of thing. Um, I'll use a lentil pasta typically okay. or some sort of legume pasta instead mm -hmm. of regular pasta because it's got a higher protein, a protein content yeah. and maybe a tofu stir fry for dinner you do have to be cognizant about protein if you're an athlete and you're trying to build muscle mm -hmm. and a little bit more so on a plant based diet so it's not you can't just take the meat off take the eggs out fry it um, take the milk out and, and then just leave with the vegetables yeah, yeah. you've really got to yeah. be a little bit conscious on it so it's yeah. not as simple as just take the meat off the plate and eat yeah. more vegetables yeah so you do need to focus on getting legumes in, so beans, peas, lentils, tofu, tempeh, and that type of thing. There's seitan also. Uh, and you can do protein powders as well. Over 50% of uh, amateur athletes do protein powders anyway. Over 80% of elite athletes do um, protein anyway. Yeah. Often uh, whey protein. Mm. It's not necessary to do protein powders, but it's a convenient, delicious way sometimes to get it in, yeah. depending on the, on the protein powder. Like, I don't even think about protein at all but again i'm not yeah for most for people this yeah no. so a lot of people they don't need to yeah um, think about it too much yeah um, but it can be like especially once you get over 40 45 then your protein requirements go up yeah. like your age you know yeah. prevent sarcopenia how old are you how old am i uh, <laughs> yeah i'm 45 i don't mind uh, and uh i'm 45 
Um, so kids you know, really need a bit more protein yeah. um, based on their body weight. Um, uh, pregnant women can sometimes be a little bit more aging, you know, my age and older. Age. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting older, so I need more protein. Just not as efficient as, you know, utilizing it. Yeah. And then if you're active, and I'm particularly active, and we well, are, you're pretty active, I've seen your yeah. social media profile. Well, so. Yeah, it's an illusion, but yeah. Yeah, you, should, you probably should uh, look at your protein and just see what it's like. But. Yeah. All right, next myth. Hmm. Um, dairy is essential for strong bones. Yeah, there's actually an inverse correlation between dairy intake and hip fracture. If you look at countries that yeah. have the highest dairy intake and yeah. the most hip fractures, which is a proxy for bone health, isn't it? Um, so you need calcium, right? Just like you need protein, you don't need, you know, you don't need meat. Yeah. You need calcium, you don't need dairy milk. Yeah. And it's a very strange concept to take, uh, you know, another species milk and, and feed it, um, you know, to humans. So you absolutely don't need it. What that is, is that's a unique selling point in marketing, right? They'll say, okay, what does this have in it? Oh, it's got calcium, so let's really play out the role of that. Mm. But we also need magnesium for good bone health, whereas a cup of um, collard greens, for example, would have more uh, account bioavailable calcium and a good amount of ca- magnesium that the milk doesn't have for bone health. So yeah. you can get that in many ways from plants. And again, animals are just the middlemen. And uh, yeah, the, the dairy for the bones thing is, is, I don't think they're even illegally, my understanding is not even legally allowed to make that claim anymore, so mm-hmm. good for your bones, because they found it not to be uh, uh, true. So the bottom line is it's calcium that you need and it's not only from yeah, milk, get it it's from, from milk, yeah. other sources. Yeah, like green. Green vegetables. Yeah. I think sesame seeds as well yeah, pretty high. In. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, next myth. Um, all right, here's a, here's a fun one that I get all the time. You can't get enough B12 as a vegan. Right. I mean, that is the one thing that uh, be, vegans should supplement is B12. You know, you can get that in fortified foods, right, or in a supplement. And I believe it's the most reliable, safest way to get B12 anyway. Yep. Um, based on the data. And the thing is, it's not just an issue for vegans. Mm-hmm. Um, 40% of Americans are low in B12, and nearly all of those are, the vast majority are meat eaters. Meat eaters. Why is that? Um, it's, I mean... The absorption capability, there's something called intrinsic factor in your gut, which doesn't always convert very well. Um, so it's just, there's a couple of ways to think about it, uh, even if you're a meat eater, which is I'm going to keep getting my blood tested and see what my levels are like, or I'll just take a supplement for insurance and be safe. Mm. And if you are on a completely plant-based diet or a very heavily plant-based diet, then um, you do want to supplement with B12 for your own. So from my understanding, B12 is a bacteria, right? So the animals... It's created by bacteria, yeah. And, right. Yeah. So where are they getting it from? Uh, so we actually make it in our gut also. So the animals make it in their gut. Okay. And, and we make it in our gut, but it's a little bit too far down for us to absorb. Okay. Um, so the animals are making it in their guts, and then it's making it into their flesh, and then, and then people are eating it. That's so interesting. Yeah. I remember reading this study years ago by Gabriel Cousins, where he talked about how the more vegetarians and vegans digest food more frequently, mm. your body and your nasal passage produces a very small amount of B12, like 0.5 mcg, which is not enough for a human to mm-hmm. like function. But the more you digest your food, basically, the more your body produces small amounts of B12s, like little tricklings. Yeah, and there's, there's parts of like in your gut, for example, you are producing it, but I think it's, it's too far down for absorption, which yeah. is key, and so, so it really is something you should definitely supplement. I think in modern society anyway, you know, well, the, the, you crazy thing is, or not, the, the like, crazy thing is that the animals are supplemented with B12 also. Yeah. So, yeah, so people say. So um, the animals are supplemented often somewhere with B12 yeah. or B12 precursors. And, you know, for example, um, iodine. One mm. of the biggest sources of iodine is milk, is dairy milk in, in the American diet. But it's because the, the teats of the cows are cleaned with potassium iodide and the inside of the, the tank of the milk tankers are cleaned with potassium iodide. So they're just supplementing and you're just supplementing mm. indirectly, mm. right? It's just the middleman again. So the animals have fed all sorts of supplements. Yeah. So if you say, oh, the vegan diet is not natural because you're supplementing. Yeah, but you, yeah. you're supplementing also just indirectly because they had to feed the animals. Yeah. And then you've got all of the risks associated with eating animal products and the negative health outcomes. It's like it's just safer. So I don't see that... You know, one argument would be, well, it's not that natural if you have to supplement. Well, first of all, people are supplementing in the modern world anyway, either Mm. directly or indirectly through animals. Um, And then we're not eating the same types of foods that we were 10, 100, you know, million, you know, 100,000 years ago, uh, or our ancestors a million years ago. Um, 
we're not eating those same foods anyway. Mm. So this sort of naturalistic fallacy is where, oh, if I just eat bison and, you know, mm. and berries falling from the tree, um, but first of all, there'd be, there'd be nutrient deficiencies. Um, but yeah, people are supplementing anyway, so I don't see the issue with supplementing with B12 mm -hmm. um, if you're completely vegan. Okay, last myth. Yeah. So um, this one came in uh, to my channel and I get this a lot. Um, and we've kind of touched on this before that growing crops for plants is worse um, for the planet than animal mm -hmm. agriculture. Yeah, well, for the planet, again, it's just the, it's just the number of, um, it's the amount of space that we're using, right? Yeah. And we're just growing way more crops for animals to eat. So it's just much more efficient to grow crops directly for humans. And Isn't no, like 75% of the world's plants are fed to animals or something like that? Yeah, well, 75% of the ag ag agricultural land uh, is for animal agriculture yields only 18% of the calories. 60% of all agricultural land in the world is for, uh, is for cows. And it yields only 2% of the calories. So 60% of the land for 2% of the calories and 5% of the protein. So that ratio is just madness. That's crazy. And, and there's this sort of this suggestion that we should be doing holistic grazing as part of regenerative ranching. Um, and that's a potential solution that people are suggesting. It doesn't make any sense. Even if you um, switched to just grass-fed, grass-finished beef, uh, Harvard and Boston University did a study showing that we would need somewhere between 69 and 250% more land. And then if you go to holistic grazing, where they're moving the cows on, you know, all, on different land all the time, you need double that. We don't, literally don't have enough space don't in the planet. Land. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's not an answer. Then there's, there's more methane produced, um, in fact, with grass uh, fed and grass finished cows than there are with um, ones that are fed in CAFOs, mm. and even more so in the holistic grazing method. So mm. there is a, so, some temporary carbon sequestration yeah. um, with holistic grazing, but it's offset by far by all the methane that's produced and so forth, which mm. is a strong, much stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So holistic grazing is not the answer. Yeah. Um, couldn't produce enough food, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not what it's cracked up to be by that movement. Yeah. The, the answer really is to free up the land and rewild the land. Yeah. Right? And so let it go back to its the you know, the, the forest land and savannas and so forth, and then you're drawing down uh, carbon. Hmm. Okay, so as we finish up, I just want you to share with my um, viewers. So I have a lot of Indian boys, especially young guys that are big into fitness mm -hmm. and some might be interested in um, bodybuilding or working out or getting mm -hmm. bigger. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you give people that are wanting to get into fitness and build their bodies and maybe they come from a household where they eat a lot of meat or they eat meat now, they might eat eggs, they might eat chicken. Mm -hmm. How does someone transition to being plant-based if yeah. they're used to having these things every day? Yeah, I mean, for a lot of people, some people can go overnight, yeah. right? but a lot of people, I think it's best not to necessarily go overnight and just to start trying more plant-based foods. And there's some simple switches that you can do, right? If you drink cow's milk, there's gonna be a plant milk usually available in most parts of the world, right? So soy milk, hemp milk, um, you know, rice milk, all these different types of milks. Mm. Personally, I prefer drink soy milk uh, because the protein content is high, about eight or nine grams of protein per cup. Um, you know, if you're on a whey protein, you can switch to a plant protein. So I think there's a simple switch you can do. Mm. And there's plenty of resources on the internet to try plant-based meals. You know, you can sort of veganize your meals if you want. So if you do a beef chili, you can do a three bean chili or something like this. Yeah. Um, so you do have to be conscious about protein. Um, I would start bringing in more plant foods, which will crowd out the animal foods. And then really aiming for around 1.5, 1.6 uh, grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. It's yep. going to maximize your muscle growth. Yeah. Um, of course, you do have to work out. You can't just eat the protein. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So you go to work out. Um, and usually, again, I'm not a fitness expert. I'm not a trainer. I'm not a personal trainer or anything like that or a certified strength and conditioning specialist. But generally hitting a lot of compound, uh, you know, even more compound lifts. Yeah. So that's like squats, bench press, pull-ups, rows, rather than sort of trying to isolate just the bicep is, uh, is what's going to pack on the mass. Um, okay. Yeah. So. Is soy bad for you? Soy is not bad for you, no. Everyone uh, says soy is bad for you. No, no, no. I mean, it's like with anything, even if you drink too much water, right, you can get hyponatremia and you can die yeah. from drinking too much water. Yeah. Then you just load and load water, yeah. water, water. So, you know, there may be um, a limit to, to the soy, 
Um, no one's really hitting that in the, in the developed world. There was a couple of cases where they thought that um, there might have been too much estrogen coming, but the reality is, if you're worried about estrogen, you should be worried about animal products, and especially milk, because um, the cows um, are made pregnant every year. A lot of people don't know this. They're made pregnant, right? They put on something called a rape rack in the industry. Made pregnant every year. They have a calf. That, that milk's meant for that calf. They take the calf away, obviously. Mm. And so, but that, that cow has a lot of hormones, a lot mm. of estrogen. And people don't realize that animal estrogen, all, in all animals, is identical to the human estrogen. Whereas the phytoestrogen that comes in, in soy and, and some other plants um, is, is different. Now, it does get taken up by some of the receptors, but in fact, if you were shifting to a more plant-based diet, that phytoestrogen actually um, fills up some of those estrogen receptors and blocks some of the additional animal estrogen from coming in, which is oh, a good wow. thing. Um, and this, was, this whole thing started originally because there's a phytoestrogen called genistine, and there were sheep that were, or rams that were eating this in clover, because it exists in clover. Um, and they were having sort of estrogenic effects on their body. But the reality is you'd have to eat a thou literally a thousand soy burgers a day in order to get the same amount of genistein that was in that clover and obviously yeah. not doing that. So, yeah. so soy, I, soy products, uh, you know, whether it's soy milk or some tofu or tempeh, I wouldn't say every day, but from very uh, often. And so they're, they're totally fine for men and for women. It actually may bring um, hormones into a more normal range. So right. if it's too high, it might bring the estrogen down. If it's too low, it might bring it up a little bit. Yeah. So it's no problem at all. So it's a myth. Yeah, total myth. Okay, so so thank you for your time. No, okay. thank you. It's been awesome. Yeah, thanks thank for you. having me. Yeah. Thanks. Bye, Bye guys.